is your emergency? Help! Oh, I need What's help! What's your situation now? My son Jeffrey! My son Jeffrey is attacking me! Hello, welcome to A Life with Culture. I'm Sinjin Flynn. In 2017, Fort Worth Opera mounted the world premiere of Voix Dire, a courtroom opera by composer Matthew Peterson and librettist Jason Zenka. Later that year, they brought the original cast back together again to record the opera, and after a successful Kickstarter campaign, it has now been released digitally and on CD. The conductor for both the world premiere and the album was Vishwa Subaraman, and he joins me now. Reporting from one night Vishwa, welcome. Two. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks so much. It's really nice to talk to you again. It feels like forever since the last time we chatted. I know. And, and now it's via Zoom. Right. Tell me about Voir dire. What's the, the sort of 30-second elevator speech about what this opera is? I think the opera really is about how we look at the concepts of justice, how we look at our fellow man, and how we look at our justice system. You know, the opera is based on actual stories that happened in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. The librettist was a court reporter and was there for almost all of the stories that you hear in the opera. Um, names are changed. Some of the things are conflated in order to protect, you know, the actual people who were in the courtroom. Right. But all of this actually happened, you know, and the fascinating thing in the opera is the evolution of the judge, right? The judge is there for almost the entirety of the opera and the evolution of how he conceives of justice and what it means to actually deliver justice is, is really what the show is about. Yeah, because really you see that, I guess the overarching theme is sort of the, the intersection of the, of the judicial system and humanity. Yeah, but I think it's, you know, I think we can extrapolate. Like what, what I love about it is like all great opera, it's not just the story you see on stage, right? It's another mirror of how we are as humans, right? And every story is, is true and every story is human, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in a courtroom. We judge each other every time we meet our friends, every time we see what car they bought. You know, judgment is kind of an innate human, human condition in a sense, right? So whether it's in a courtroom or whether it's, you know, what shirt are you wearing? You know, those are the kinds of things that we do on a daily basis. This might be termed a chamber opera. What sort of forces are involved in voir dire? Well, you know, it's just a handful of singers. You have, you know, and all, all the singers can per portray multiple characters during the show. Right. So it's, it's really small forces. Um, the orchestra is incredibly tiny, you know, basically a string quintet with piano doubles on some instruments some percussion, et cetera. So it is a chamber opera. And I think the idea that Matthew had when he was putting it together was the concept of being able to feel like you're in a judge's chamber. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to feel like you're in a courtroom. And so if it was an expansive work, it would distance the audience from the action. Um, and so I think the intimacy is really necessary for this work. Right. Because the stories are very intimate, aren't they? Very much so. Um, I mean, from everything from a child who killed his mother to a custody dispute over a parrot, you know, you, you have you have the I mean, and, and that's is that that's a summation of humanity. Right. Like we have we have all of that in us. Um, and so. In that sense, yeah, it's very intimate. Jeffrey Schumacher is the character who kills his mother. He never actually appears in the opera, does he? He's represented no. by an empty chair. An empty chair and the ghost of his mother. Um, there's an entire section where it's like the channeling of the ghost of his mother, who, you know, basically was an overprotective mother and and was convinced that he had every illness known to man, you know? And so in her own hypochondria, she kind of projected it onto her child. And he Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen by proxy, yep. And in fact, after the, the brief open, I think the first sort of harrowing scene is a recreation of the 911 call that Mrs. Schumacher makes as her son is attacking her. Yep. And then, and, and honestly, that's some of the hardest music to put together, um, both because it's emotionally charged and Matthew mm -hmm. wanted to, wanted it to feel 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for, wanted it to feel uncomfortable. And so rhythmically, it's so incredibly challenging to put together. It's almost uncomfortable for us to play. So <laughs> we're able to kind of channel that idea very easily, I guess. Um, but it's, it's a that is a really fascinating, the opening of the art, I think, I feel like the opera gets going so quickly because of that 911 call. Right. And I should say that this the, the opera is an amalgamation of, of scenes. It is, but it it is, but it has a continuity, and I don't know how to explain it other than you you when you listen to it or when you experience the opera, you never feel like the story is disjunct. Right. Um, and that's what I found to be one of Matthew's real talents. It is a story, it is a, it's scenes, and the way he put it together, it's like we have the depth of the 911 call, but then we have a comedic moment. And then we have, you know, so he's able to like break up the tension. And so we're not stuck in just this darkness forever. There are these moments of humor and there are these moments that kind of let us breathe before we have to jump back into the harsher storytelling or the more difficult storytelling. And Judge Dodsworth is a sort of a through line in many respects, isn't it? Yep. And Judge Dodsworth, I think, I think it, for me, it's the evolution of him that is kind of supposed to be us. You know, I think he represents the evolution that we as audience members are supposed to go through through this piece. So what's, what's his attitude at the beginning and, and, and what's it like at the end? How has he, how has he developed? Well, I, at the beginning, he's very, he's just trying to get his courtroom together. He's trying to get the day's work done. And by the end of it, he really is questioning whether he delivered any justice at all. Right. Whether he did the right thing and whether the decisions he made and sometimes constrained by laws that he has to follow because they're the laws of our land. But yep. they does it really deliver justice? You know, did he do right by the people that he's 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 trying? And so I think that's really it. it I love the fact that he leaves us on a question in that sense. You know, there's no pat answer to this. There's no right. happy ending. There's no denouement that's so clear that we all feel like we know what the message was about. It forces us to kind of keep thinking about it as we walk out of the door of the it's theater. It's open-ended. It's open-ended, but I think he, he, he leaves you with so many good kernels. I mean, Jason's libretto is really brilliant that way. He leaves you, leaves you with so many kernels of questions that it's not like it's open-ended. You walk out and it's like, oh, well, that was a lot. It's right. wow. Okay, that was a really interesting story. How would I have judged that? And what did we do the right thing by putting her, like putting her out of jail, even though she wanted to stay in jail because she has nowhere to go? One of the characters who was who was Alicia being beaten Simpson. by Alicia Simpson was being beaten by her. You always know these things better than I do. Um, <laughs> it's funny when you're conducting, you don't think of the characters' names because the plot line is so in the moment of the music. I don't know how to explain it, but I almost never remember who each person's name is. Even when I'm doing Tosca, you never think of, oh, Tosca comes in. It's the next aria and the next moment of, of the character's moment. I don't know how to explain it, but that's kind of how my mind works when I'm in the theater. Right, um, it's the sound of the voice. It's the sound of the voice and it's okay. They come in stage right, so I have to catch them stage right. And then we have the dramatic pace is supposed to do this. And then she always likes to push a little bit here and the trombones are always too loud there. You know, those are the kinds of things that go through your head sometimes when you're doing a show. Um, it's funny how little of each opera I remember at the end of the night. Like I walk out and I can tell you everything that went wrong, but I very rarely could tell you how great a performance was. <laughs> But, but I think what Jason did was, you know, even the question of Alicia Simpson, right, who's being beaten by her boyfriend and she moved to Wisconsin to be with him and she has no place to go. And she's like, please put me in jail. And the judge is like, I can't. There's no law that allows me to do that. Right. And, you know, Wisconsin in the winter is not a place you want to be outside. Yeah. And there is a story of uh, Professor Milton, isn't it, who is up on... Uh, child pornography child channels. pornographer yep and he is an unusual case in that again he comes up against the judicial system right from the very beginning he just wants to plead guilty but he can't or the right. judge won't let him right because the judge feels like in order for justice to be done his story has to go through a court case you know in order for it to all come out right and Professor Milton is like, I know I'm wrong. I know this is a horrible thing. It's something I haven't been able to control. I'm guilty. Put me in jail. And yet, we're, we can't do that. You know, these are these are these are really interesting moments that you kind of walk out and you have to kind of you question about how we deliver justice and whether it is actually fair. 
And then we have Kathy Jones Morganson and Kathy Morganson Jones. They are sisters in law. And here we have a lot of comedy. They're fighting over a macaw. They're fighting. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a custody dispute over a macaw. And one of them is incredibly religious, the other one likes to watch trash TV. So the parrot has learned the vocabulary of both. <laughs> and the parrot in the opera is played by, of course, the bass baritone. So, you know, we, ha- we have to have a low voice singing in falsetto. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite scenes in the opera. And then the way it ends is just a riot. Because the parrot is actually called as a witness. Yeah, the parrot is called as a witness. So the parrot is, of course, channeling, channeling the vocabulary of, of really trash TV and biblical sayings and flitting between the two. Because in the, in the biblical household, Kathy has named him Gilead. And in the trash TV household, Kathy has named, the other Kathy has named him Norman. Norman. <laughs> yeah. Yep, his name is Norman. Norman? Norman? Yep. You know, and that's again another one of those places where you see the soprano and the mezzo soprano taking on different roles, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Alicia Simpson's played by the mezzo, but now, you know, she switches and she's one of the sister, sisters in law. And so, in that sense, for this opera, it really takes an incredible cast. Um, and we were lucky we had that. Um, because you, you do have to kind of change character from the ability, to, from the deep pathos to that moment of like utter comedy. And it is a riot. And it is one of those places as a conductor, you really have to not watch the stage because if you do, you'll just, you'll start laughing. And there's not a moment you can't, I, I, seriously, it's one of those moments, like there's some moments in theater where you, as a conductor, just look at your score because if you look at the stage, it's too distracting because it's too good. Yes. That's one of those. Right. This comes under the rubric perhaps of a a CNN opera opera that's ripped from the headlines um would you agree with that I you know I think all too often operas that are that go that route tend to be more pop and more surface and I think this has more depth than than something just quickly Mm -hmm. ripped from the headlines right I think because it does a lot of a lot more character ex- exploration and it does involve like it, it i think the reality of some of the characters makes it make it difficult for me to be able to look at it as a kind of a rip from the headlines pop opera you know when i say that though i'm thinking more of nixon in china than jerry spring of the opera there okay. is a there is a depth but but it, it does it doesn't pull from from legend. It doesn't pull from uh, the past. It pulls very much from current day humanity. One hundred percent. That's fair. That is fair. But again, I'm I'm one of those people who thinks Mozart is still as relevant now as he was then, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think this is what composers and librettists have been trying to do through the entirety of opera, for the most part. You know. The, the stuff that has lasted is are the works that really we feel like are relevant to us now. And it really is amazing as humanity how little we've changed, right? If you think about Marriage of Figaro and right. the class distinctions and Mozart, you know, he was getting paid by the emperor and here he is making fun of royalty, yeah. you know? And so I think we, we have those issues now. We just, we call them different things, right? We call them CEOs and we call them blue collar workers and, you know, we, we haven't really changed that much as humanity, you know, over the centuries. It's like Don Giovanni, I saw a production fairly recently. Uh, and in the era of the Me Too movement, Don Giovanni takes on a whole new depth. Completely different, right? But it's still relevant, you know? It's, uh-huh. it is, it's a story that we deal with. And again, we have the same issues in this. I think, I, you know, I... I'm so impressed with this opera that I really do believe it's one that it's going to last. Um, you know, it, it had a, it had a difficult birthing and that it had been canceled so much and had been programmed so much. But I think now that it's going up, going, I have a feeling it's going to make the rounds. Um, it's difficult because when you look at the libretto and you don't have the context of the music, the libretto can be pretty harsh. Yes, it can. You know, there but are, I think the, there is some straightforward language. 
<laughs> there is some very straightforward language, but that's also, again, our reality, right? You know, right. You, you can flip channels now and half the cable channels don't even bother bleeping language. Yeah. Um, so I think there's this issue and this question of how much reality are we allowed to take in the opera world? And my argument is, why not all of it? And yeah. to a certain extent, this is kind of that, that work. You have always had a, a strong commitment to contemporary opera. How do you see opera developing? How do you see it changing um, over time? The operas that are being written today versus even 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I think composers now are more willing to choose the musical styles they need to tell the story. So we have a greater eclecticism within the works. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not a bashfulness to use modern, and by that I mean even pop idioms, you know, rock idioms, rap idioms. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing more of the incorporation of what we might hear when we turn the dial on the radio even. Um, but still with a great sense of structure and an understanding of craft. Um, the American opera world has been really fascinating in that there has been a dedication to more minority works, mm -hmm. you know, works by African-American composers, works that deal with minority stories. Um, where I'd like to see that go is to the main stage as opposed to constantly being second stage works. You know, I think we need to start treating them as though they're equivalent, you know, and that comes with time and it comes with building our audience. You know, I think 50 years ago, if, I couldn't imagine a composer using multiple styles in a single opera, you know, at, at the rate it is now. You might, they might use it for a moment in a scene or to depict, you know, nostalgia or whatnot, but you wouldn't see it kind of being the hallmark of a work, you know. Composers right. were hell-bent on their own styles and they wanted to make sure that, you know, it came through that it was their work. You talk about minorities in opera, and of course, this year's Pulitzer Prize for Music went to uh, Anthony Davis for his opera, The Central Park Five. Um, and we see, uh, I mean, there are minority voices that are coming into the opera world, aren't there? I mean, we're here. We've been here for a while. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, I, I hope we're, we're starting to be listened to, but you know, I mean, minority performers, like we've had a lot of incredible African-American performers. We've had, you know, that has been a hallmark of the opera world, you know, since the Leontine Prices and, you know, and now the Larry Brownleys and Eric Owens. And, you know, we have singers, you know, what I'd like to see more are the mm -hmm. stage directors, the writers, the composers. You know, I was lucky to pre premiere work with Opera Philadelphia that we took to the Apollo in New York, you know. And to see an opera written by an all, like it was an all African-American creative team. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill T. Jones was directing, Daniel Bernard Romain was the composer, Mark Lamuti Joseph was the librettist. And, you know, to watch them put an opera together and not, and it was great because you didn't have a white dramaturg sitting there saying, well, but in Mozart's era, this is what they did. And then, you know, so it was a completely like free opportunity for them to write a theater piece, right? you know, and, but those opportunities are incredibly rare. You know, that's one of the things that I think the, I know, I know Opera America and the, the coalition of opera companies are trying to figure out how to change, but it is a very difficult thing when the voices are missing in, our, in the artistic director positions and the, in the, on the boards, you know, how many opera boards are diverse, you know? Right. And so I don't even think it's necessarily overt racism as much as unconscious. Like the thought wasn't given to, do we need to hire minorities? And then once we do hire minorities, how do we support them in a field that is incredibly white? You know, and those are the two questions that I don't think are being explored enough. Mm -hmm. You know, too often, we, oh, we got we hired this minority and they're going to do it. Well, yeah, but the community doesn't always rally around that or, or, you know, the people don't quite get what you're trying to do because it is different. We have a different viewpoint of the world. Yeah. And there is still that perception of opera as being something that's, for the elite or those that would consider themselves the elite um you know we do have to uh, we do have to work against that don't we true and i think that's more of an american conceit than perhaps european right and a lot of that has to do with what happened in the seven, 60s and 70s right when opera was booming we built these big halls we turned and the money was coming in right but as that as those 
opera patrons, donors started dying off, their mm -hmm. kids didn't necessarily have the same desire to donate at the same levels, right? So over the past 20 years, we've translated more of our fixed cost in opera production to ticket prices, right? And we, you know, when yeah. you have state funding in Europe, as they do, you, know, you can go to the opera for 20 euros. And so that makes it more available, that keeps it from being elitist. I mean, go to Vienna. My God, it's one of the most fabulous places to watch opera. That standing room is like 20 year olds of every ilk, whatever, watching opera, you know? Yeah. Every race, creed, it doesn't matter. You go to Paris, it's very similar. Berlin is the same, right? I mean, I stood in line in Berlin to see Larry Brownlee sing once, you know, it was a last minute ticket and it cost me 30 euros. Right. And right. here, tell me where we can do that, you know, and be, it's cost. Opera can't get cheaper. We can, you know, every other, every other corporation could develop efficiencies in production. We can't do Marriage of Figaro with three people. And we can't do it, <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't do it faster to cut cost, right? Those are, you know, it costs the same number of people as it did in Mozart's era. And it costs more for those people to live now than it did in Mozart's era. So the problem is we have a cost level that's rising and we need donors. How are opera companies negotiating, or sorry, not negotiating, navigating the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? It's still a lot of mystery. I mean, a lot of companies are hoping that by January, February, they can get their seasons back up and running. Um, but there's a, there is a, a fear of long-term planning right now because we don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, and but I do think there's some really creative things coming out. You know, you, you're seeing companies do a lot more online, a lot more archival videos are being streamed. Um, mm -hmm. And some, you know, my friend Kamala Sankaram is doing like an all Zoom oriented opera, you know, and she's got people in different places doing different parts of the recording and they're putting in this really it's brilliant. You know, mm -hmm. doesn't help me as a conductor because I'd like to stand in front of an orchestra, but <laughs> There's some really creative work being done by these companies, you know, and I think that has to be lauded. But, you know, I think we all want to get back to the point where we can have an orchestra in the pit and singers on stage. Well, look, Vishwa, I know that uh, you're sitting at home waiting for uh, those conducting gigs to, uh, to come your way again. Thank you for taking the time to do this. And we really appreciate you talking about Vuade. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks. And I hope people like the recording. We're really proud of it. Thank and I should say that uh, Vardir is available from uh, Red House Music and it can also be downloaded from iTunes. Yep. I'm Sin Jump Thin. This is A Life with Culture. Thank you for joining me. Loosely.